Hi everyone, welcome to the belated Semester 1 NHS Speaker Series, which we've renamed to be the CA Student Symposium. As you know from the beginning of the year, the theme for this year's series is health, and we chose that for obvious reasons. We're about to enter the third year of this public health crisis, which is a little hard to believe. But in addition to the tens of thousands of public health workers helping us fight this pandemic, data analysts have also been hard at work predicting what will happen next. That's what we want to talk about today. As we pour over graphs of COVID cases and hospitalizations, we'll discuss the importance of health-related data analytics. So please, join me in welcoming CA alum, Ms. Holly May. Hey Chargers, NHS is so excited to invite Ms. Holly May to talk about the topic of health for the speaker series. Ms. May is a Cary Academy alum who currently serves as Chief People Officer at DataVins, a company tackling one of the most pressing issues facing healthcare, the fragmentations of patient data across platforms and institutions. Founded by Mr. Travis May, Ms. May's husband and also CA alum, DataVan is now a leading company in the healthcare and health data industry. Ms. May, a graduate of Harvard University and Stanford Graduate School of Business, remains close with the Care Academy community. She is an active member of CA's board of directors, served as the 2019 commencement keynote speaker, and created the generous Metter May Scholarship here at Care Academy. Today, Ms. May will be speaking to us about her personal experiences in the health and data industry, and we'll follow it up with a quick Q&A session. So without further ado, I'll hand it off to Ms. May. Catherine, thank you so much for that warm introduction and to the uh, National Honor Society for this program. Um, it's wonderful to be with you all. I know this is uh, recorded in advance of uh, when you're all watching this in your advisory sessions. Um, I'll kick off here with just a little bit of color on, on my story uh, and, and my experience at Cary Academy. And then I'll give a couple of examples of what uh, Datavant, the company where I work, uh, is doing with, with healthcare data and some of the problems that we're solving and some of the impacts that we're hoping to create for patients. Um, and then uh, Catherine will jump back on and ask me a couple of additional questions. Uh, so I graduated from Cary Academy in 2005 and I attended from sixth grade through 12th grade. Uh, while I was there, I played uh, soccer and field hockey. We were uh, we created the field hockey team uh, during the time I was uh, I was on the team. In the first two seasons, no one had ever played before. We were terrible and we lost every game, uh, and it ended up becoming a, a really fantastic team and one of my uh, kind of highlight memories from uh, time in school. And I was also active in the National Honor Society and student government. Uh, I went on to uh, study at Harvard and quickly after moved to San Francisco after college. Um, Catherine mentioned in the introduction, but um, I married my uh, best friend who I met at Cary Academy. Travis and I have been friends since middle school uh, at CA and, and dating since uh, our time together in the upper school. And fast forward a number of years, uh, four years ago, I joined Datavant. At the time, the company had 17 employees, one seven, really small startup in San Francisco, uh, and we're much larger now. Today, I lead the people function. Uh, you may know the phrase HR. So I lead the HR function for a company with 8,000 employees and $700 million in annual revenue. Um, I had a baby two years ago, right before COVID. And I relocated from San Francisco back to the Triangle at the start of COVID to, uh, to be close to family. So I'm talking to you from uh, not too far down the road in Cary. In terms of what Datavant does, um, and Catherine gave me some context on, on uh, talking about health and technology, I'll, I'll walk through briefly two example use cases, two example ways that uh, Datavant software uh, is, is used in the healthcare sector. So we do a lot of work with companies that create and launch new drugs and innovations. Uh, and we also do work that supports the public sector. So working with government organizations. And one of my favorite things that we, we do is working with the Veterans Administration. The VA is the federal government organization that provides healthcare to US military veterans. Um, and the topic here is opioid use in a particular region, the Mid-Atlantic region of the United States. So US veterans who are living in the Mid-Atlantic region um, and specifically those who are managing chronic pain, chronic pain is a condition that occurs in about two out of three um, veterans. So very, very common, 65% of folks have it who are veterans. So for US veterans who are managing chronic pain, um, many of them receive care both from the VA directly 
as well as from doctor's offices and clinics that are not part of the VA, right? So imagine if your VA clinic that you're assigned to is maybe has a long wait list to, to get an appointment or is further away, and it's just as easy for you to go get care at some other location uh, that, that might be more convenient or faster for you. And so studies have shown, and the VA has shown this themselves, that veterans who receive care at both VA and non-VA locations, so community locations and VA locations, end up getting prescribed opioids way more often uh, than patients who are only seen inside the VA. And that makes sense, right? If you're being treated by two doctors who don't talk to each other and they each give you a prescription for the same condition, you might end up with double the amount of medicine that you then you should take. Uh, and so the VA works with DataVant to dig in on this, on this kind of problem and figure out if they could figure out a solution. So we took a few different inputs. And so the inputs were um, health data from medical records at a large health system that is not associated with the VA. So kind of a, imagine like a university healthcare system in the same region. Um, we then were able to link that with data from the Veterans Affairs, uh, the Veterans Administration health information system, kind of the electronic medical records the VA runs. And then we were also able to layer on top of that uh, regional health information exchanges, so kind of city and county level information that all covered the same geographic area. And with data advanced technology, we could link an individual person, a single human being through those different data sets that are not connected or don't talk to each other. And we were able to create a single database or a source of truth regarding opioid prescriptions to veterans, regardless of where they were seen and cared for in the Mid-Atlantic area. And based on that unique data set, um, the VA was able to draw patterns and trends and ultimately improve care coordination, which is the process of making sure that an individual patient has a kind of seamless and coordinated journey through the healthcare system, and ultimately reduce uh, the misuse of opioids among uh, veterans who were using veteran administration healthcare practices as well as community healthcare practices. Um, and of course, um, misuse of opioids is, is highly linked with um, overdoses and suicide. And so there's a, hopefully a, a positive story here of using technology to uh, find new patterns and help uh, make sure that those, those veterans are getting the right amount of opioid uh, prescriptions for their illnesses and not an excessive amount. Um, so it's one example of how uh, the siloed data between those different health care providers um, we could connect and link in a safe and secure way and, and, and create that opportunity for patient impact. Um, another example uh, I'll talk about here is COVID. So it's easy to think of research questions um, around COVID. Um, so here's, here's a simple one. How does COVID impact patients with diabetes differently from patients without diabetes? Um, and given the prevalence of diabetes, I'm sure many uh, students here in, in, in the school um, can identify with this. This question seems like really straightforward, but it turns out that the data that you need to answer this question is not in any one single place. It's not connected and it's highly fragmented. So first you've got vaccination data or maybe even booster data. This might live on your little paper card um, and maybe it lives in a digital system at your drugstore where you got your vaccine or maybe it lives in a digital system at a healthcare location. Um, I know I was very eager to get vaccinated and end up driving uh, two hours east towards the coast to get a, an appointment quickly. That's not a location I've ever received healthcare in the past, nor will I ever go back to. And so the fact that I got my vaccine at that particular location, halfway to the beach, uh, is, not, is not particularly linked to any other information about me. So that's vaccine data. Then you've got data about patients' diabetes status, which is probably kept in their primary care provider's medical records or their endocrinologist's office records or their personal devices that they use to care for their diabetes. Then you've got metrics like outcomes, like were they hospitalized? Did they require an ambulance ride? And those sorts of data points and metrics are not tracked in any of the other systems that we've talked about previously. And if a patient is hospitalized, whether they're discharged safely 
or whether they die in the hospital is not a data point that's connected to any of the other data points that we've talked about. And so nothing links all this together, which makes a study like how are diabetes patients impacted differently from those who don't have diabetes if they get COVID is really hard to analyze and, and link together those data sets. And that linkage of an individual human through multiple data sets is at the core of what uh, data advanced software uh, does. And so we um, were able to remove and protect personal identity information, like your social security number, the name, your address, your date of birth, um, while still creating a unique identifier, like a 24 letter number code um, that can be used to link an individual person's data through these different data sets. Um, so I'll stop there. I know we have a few minutes here for questions, um, Catherine, but that's the quick overview of what uh, data event software technology is used in, uh, is used to link fragmented health data in order to improve patient outcomes. Well, thank you, Ms. May, for a wonderful presentation with some really great examples. Um, so about a week ago, we sent out a survey to the student body asking for any questions for Ms. May, and we've compiled them into a quick Q&A. Um, we received many questions, but with for the best interest in time, we'll just focus on a few questions. So for the first one, um, Ms. May is a very inspirational figure for us in our community. Um, so we're just wondering, what do you think has been your most significant success? And on the contrary, what has been the biggest obstacle? Hmm. Uh, these are hard questions. Um, I think one, one success that I'm, I'm proud of in kind of my personal life is um, when I, uh, when I was sort of finishing high school and going off to college, my relationship with my mom and dad was uh, pretty frayed. Um, maybe, maybe some of you can, uh, can, can relate, um, but I, I had a lot of tension and challenge and I was very, very excited to leave home. Uh, and I went thousands of miles away for university. And one of the things I'm proud of over the next couple of years that followed was really repairing that relationship. Um, and I ended up moving home to be close to my family and have a great relationship now with my parents. And, and, and it was a piece of kind of growing up and like realizing that that was a really important relationship for kind of my core foundation um, and did a lot of a lot to kind of go home for the holidays and, and call. And for a period of time, I called my parents almost daily as a grown adult with a career. Uh, and so that, that's a dimension that's been uh, kind of uh, a very positive addition. And, and when I was 18 and 19 years old, might have gone a very different way. Um, and then you also asked about kind of a, a major obstacle. Um, when I applied to graduate school, um, I applied to a number of business school programs. I was living in San Francisco and my number one choice was to go to Stanford. Um, it's a great program and it's very convenient to where I was uh, already located. So I didn't need to kind of uproot my life. And I got really excited. Um, I applied and I got waitlisted. And then every six weeks for about nine months, they would give you an update on the admission status. And I got waitlisted. And then six weeks later, I would log into the website to check on status and I was still waitlisted. So it was a very traumatic kind of emotional period. Um, those of you who are seniors who are thinking about college admissions, you probably recall that going to the mailbox or firing up your email and waiting to find, find out the news. Did that, um, eventually nine months of this happened and I got rejected. And I was really grateful for the news because it was decisive. At least I could move on, I could turn the page. Um, I was sad, it wasn't the outcome I wanted. And then weirdly enough, about three days after the rejection, the Dean of Admissions for the business school at Stanford called me and basically said they really wanted me to come and like, would I consider coming? School started like 10 days later. I was thrilled, I was confused. And I ended up uh, giving notice to my job, quitting my job that day uh, and, and relocating 30 miles south to Palo Alto and finding an apartment and buying a car and all that stuff. But the part that was the biggest challenge was when I set foot on campus, I literally thought they ranked every student, they drew a line at the bottom and they said, this group's accepted, this group is rejected. And because of my status of being waitlisted, then rejected, then getting in, I felt really confident that I was the least good student who made it onto campus. And so I walked onto campus on the first day of school and for most of the first two quarters, thinking I was the least qualified student who had barely snuck in. 
and have this really overpowering sense of kind of imposter syndrome and, you know, did they make a mistake and do I deserve this? And over time, I was able to come through that and ended up having a fantastic experience at school and, and was a really great two years of, of learning. Um, but that, that first probably four to six months of feeling like, did I deserve it? Did they make a mistake? Did I really earn my spot? Am I the least qualified person here was, was particularly challenging. Well, thank you so much for sharing on this, man. It's, um, I think, really relevant to how students feel nowadays, but definitely a very important experience. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, moving more towards, I guess, relevant issues. Um, I know you gave a few examples on how um, data has been impacted by COVID, but um, we have a question asking how data advance analytics work has been impacted by COVID. So maybe the methodology or how um, everyone, the technology is changing. How is that impacted by COVID? Yeah, it's been really positive, which is a weird thing to say about COVID, but I think um, COVID really lit a fire um, under everyone's kind of feet around health data. So there was a lot of research uh, dollars and interest coming from the US federal government. You had the FDA, the CDC, the NIH, everybody was trying to figure things out. You had companies who would normally never play nice together saying, let's band together in pro bono uh, consortiums and share data and figure this out. So it really became as a crisis, a rallying call. And one of the things that DataVant did, um, our business is really about connecting data, connecting users of data, connecting organizations. We decided to do that in the context of COVID. And so we put out a call to lots of organizations, universities, companies that we worked with, entities that have relevant health data, and said, hey, let's pool all this data that we have. Some of it's from insurance claims, some of it's from medical records, some of it's on you know, fitness trackers. When you get sick with COVID, you stop exercising, things like that. And we were able to create this uh, research database that has a scientific advisory board and a whole application process to get access to it. And it's, it's one of the few um, linked data sets that touches on uh, COVID for many, many different aspects. Um, and, and, and we were able to put all this together for free for use in academic research and public policy research. And it became kind of a go-to um, research database with hundreds of, of people submitting proposals and, and, and hundreds of people coming into the database and the data sets. We now have, I think, you know, hundreds of articles that have been published in scientific peer-reviewed journals that have been based off of this particular data set. Um, and, and the topics range from everything like the diabetes example I gave earlier to um, racial disparities in access to care and racial disparities in outcomes to public policy kind of dis differences in sort of does wearing masks in schools make a different impact for teachers or for students and how we think about the costs of that. Uh, and so the COVID as a crisis really rallied a lot of minds and money towards how can we make sense of this and being in the business of connecting health data um, has actually would really excel it's accelerated our business significantly and helped us form partnerships and relationships that have been um, not only positive from a business perspective but really positive from a social impact perspective. That's wonderful that um, DataVan is able to do so well in such special circumstances and really make breakthroughs um, with the data that's, that we have. Um, I think we have time for one last question. I think this one's um, pretty relevant to everyone. I know that high school is a time, college, careers. Um, so Ms. May, from your perspective, what life advice would you leave for um, us high schoolers in um, any different period of life? So um, maybe in high school, maybe in college, um, in future careers, or even in life in general? Uh, that's a big question, Catherine. Kind of makes me feel old. I don't know if I feel like I've uh, achieved enough to uh, to have wise, uh, wise sage life advice. Um, from my own experience, uh, kind of the, the earlier age of what you mentioned, I would say like, be good about your investments with family, um, especially that'll be true with friends as well. I think of friends as the family that you choose and family is the, fr is the uh, family that you get. Um, but whether it's with you know, kin, uh, family, or, or chosen kind of friends, just be, be really thoughtful about the relationships you want to take forward with you. And, and uh, you know, we're not, it, you have to invest in those. Um, and if you don't, you know, folks will, uh, will, will fall away in different ways. Um, 
I think, I think that's true in different stages of life. Um, when I graduated from business school, one of the professors who gave a talk had some version, his title of his talk was like, go to all the weddings, go to all the funerals. And it was kind of the same idea of you know, throughout your life, kind of show up for the people around you because they're not always there. Um, I think I might also say, um, like, <laughs> it's gonna sound really silly, but just like rest and like not doing things is really, really important. Um, I, I'm a person who's always strived, you know, strived for grades, strived for college acceptances, strived for promotions, strived for a raise. Um, and I've had a few periods in my professional career where I've actually taken a break between jobs um, or taken a sabbatical. Uh, and just the power of being rested, of not having an alarm and of being able to wake up in the morning fresh is so rare and so powerful. Um, give, give it a shot. Uh, it probably doesn't sound feasible right now in, in, in high school with all the uh, pressures and, and, and demands and maybe not in college, but um, give yourself the opportunity at some point to be bored and to be really rested. And that's a very, very powerful, um, powerful dimension. Wonderful. Um, thank you, Ms. May, for your time and insights. It's been really incredible to hear about your personal experiences and um, your career. So. On behalf of NHS and the entire student body, um, I'd like to thank you again, Ms. May. We are so incredibly grateful to have you as our speaker today and learn so much from you.